So we'll just start with a motivation reflection to kind of get us into the right headspace. So um, this is just, you know, not a strictly speaking meditation. This is more just kind of a reflective exercise. Um, so if you want to close your eyes or if you want to write um, whatever feels comfortable to you, or if you just want to think, um, get yourself kind of centered and nice posture. <sighs> some sort of posture that's different to your television watching posture or your email watching posture, something that's uh, not relying on the chair behind you, just kind of straight up and down. And then think to yourself, what is my most basic immediate reason for meditating or wanting to learn about meditation? my first most basic reason, what would that be? Just trying to say that to yourself, articulate it to yourself. Maybe it's for less stress, Maybe it's for more mindfulness. Maybe it's curiosity. Maybe it's boredom. Maybe it's desperation. Maybe it's inspiration. So many possible reasons. And so whatever your small or immediate motivation is, then think to yourself, what is a slightly bigger or deeper reason to meditate? More than just getting through the day. something about living a more intentional life, more careful and articulate with our speech, more kind and patient in our general aspect, seeking or connecting with our meaning and purpose. Just trying to stretch into a slightly bigger motivation for learning about meditation. You could think learning about meditation is in a way learning about my own self and my own mind. And the better I have deep self-awareness, the more control I'll have on my actions of body, speech, and mind. The clearer my habits will become to myself, making them easier to choose which to keep and which to discard. And in knowing myself more deeply, it's easier to see myself reflected in every single human being and all sentient beings. Even though their choices and behaviors might be different than mine, I'll come to know their deeper motivations and drives, creating more pathways of empathy, compassion, wisdom. And then if it feels comfortable, stretch into an even larger motivation for learning about meditation. May whatever I learn facilitate the development of this mind to its fullest potential. 
my mind's fullest potential. I could call it enlightenment or Buddhahood. I could call it nirvana or liberation. I could call it being self-actualized or integrated. Whatever your definition of potentiality is, that this might be a tool or a pathway to that end. And that in working for one's own potential, we do this not just for ourselves, but in order to be of benefit to society, to friends and family, to coworkers, to all living beings. And all of this mental effort May it leave a legacy behind us when we change form, continuing to benefit others. Okay, so one of the key features in getting a good daily practice is asking yourself, why do I want a good daily practice? Yeah, one of the most important things in learning to meditate is asking yourself, why do I want to meditate? There's so much out there about, you know, it helps you prevent Alzheimer's and dementia, or it helps you develop concentration and clarity. Uh, it'll help you have more mindfulness in your daily life. And so you can get kind of a, like, I should do this. I should do this. You know, like I should eat more kale, you know, like quinoa is really good for me. Like I need more supplements of, you know, iron and calcium. Like you get kind of a shooting because I want to be a healthy individual. I should do this. It's a thing I should do, you know, like Pilates, you know, like it can start to feel like, something on your tick list, rather than something that um, kind of comes from within as a really inspiring idea, you might have a sense of it being a really inspiring idea. And then kind of all of the noise around this word meditation can kind of take the inspiration from it. And it starts to feel like a chore, or it starts to feel like some sort of pressure. And so what you wanna do is just kind of shake your head clear of all of the noise about what is meditation and look at what were the ancient reasons from any number of spiritual traditions for doing something like this. And then look at yourself side by side with those ancient reasons and ask, are those my reasons or do I want them to be my reasons? And you know, if you set a motivation to meditate so that you have less stress in your life, that's okay, but then the energy of that ends at the end of the day. And so what's more useful is to think, I want to do this for the biggest reason, and then all of my everyday miscellaneous goals will be achieved as a byproduct. You know, so like, for example, if you think, I want to run a marathon, then all sorts of other activities will be accomplished as a byproduct. You'll probably start eating healthier. You'll probably start getting good routines. You'll get healthy in all sorts of different ways. Your life will get more disciplined in all sorts of ways. And you know, so all these smaller goals get achieved as a byproduct of having a big goal. So goals are tricky for our mind because we can get into perfectionism and we can get into you know, pressure and shoulds and that's not the point at all think of a goal like enlightenment as something that intrigues you, something you're curious about, something that maybe is out there or in there. You know, just don't put a pressure on it or a timeline on it, but holding it as an ideal then can help you build momentum towards that. So I think it's very important before you try any kind of spiritual practice to ask yourself why. And if you don't know the answer, it's totally fine. You know, just keep the question wide open and flexible and maybe it's different things on different days. But the, the question, why am I doing this can really drop you into what is the point of my life? What is the meaning of my life? What has given me connection and purpose? And no one is gonna tell me that. You know, I'm the one that needs to figure that out myself and I can use wisdom from a number of different areas, but my life is my life. 
you know, no, no one else is in charge of my life, but me. So, um, you know, it's not like all of the answers will be revealed just by waiting, um, if that makes sense. So this question why is a really important place to start with. Okay, so once you get a kind of a little bit of a why, you know, I want to develop my potential. Apparently this meditation thing is useful for that. What do I do? And, you know, you go and you sit down and something about straight back, something about breath, probably, right? You know, okay. Oh, should I control my breath? Should I not control my breath? Should I count my breaths? Should I not count my breaths? Oh man, should I focus on the breath at the nose? Should I focus it at the tel tummy? Where should I focus my breath? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you know, and you might give yourself a panic attack and anxiety. You know, it can happen, it can happen. Um, alternatively, you can start to focus on the breath and your body and your mind are so happy to be still that you just go to sleep, <laughs> you know? It's like, thank you so much for stopping for a moment. Shut down. <laughs> you know. So all of those things are very normal. Um, but it's good to have a plan before you sit down is the point. So, you know, you think in the morning, what's my launch sequence for the day? And my launch sequence for the day needs to involve this motivation. And this motivation can be planted and reinforced before I'm even on the cushion. And maybe that's even more useful. Maybe that'll kind of get the juices flowing. You know, maybe I'm thinking about my motivation for meditation, like my motivation for my life, like my motivation for my day, my motivation for my friends and family's interactions. Maybe my motivation is just one word. It's peace, it's compassion, it's equanimity, it's whatever, but your word and you think it deeply as you wake up and then you, you know, stumble to the bathroom and do your bathroom things and just kind of like let it hover in there. And maybe you're like, oh, I don't want to meditate yet. I'm going to have my shower first. You get in the shower and you're like, shh, 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 shh. you know, I don't know what you do when you wash your hair, something like this, right? Um, but you're thinking all the things about what is the point? What is the purpose? Not just what do I have to do today? You know, it's like before I even think about what I have to do today, what do I want to underpin what I have to do today? You know, what do I want to hold me throughout the day? You know, and all of that can be happening before you get to any kind of meditation cushion. And it means that once you get to a meditation cushion or chair or stool or whatever, that you actually have some momentum and grounding to stay on your seat and to want to be there rather than feeling like a chore. So you're thinking, you know, the purpose of my life is to free others and myself from suffering, to bring others and myself happiness. At this stage in my development, everything I do is an educated guess with limited impact, but is still worthwhile. I would like that impact to be deeper and more accurate and the radius to expand. I would like that, you know, wouldn't we all like that? And so when you're thinking in those terms, then what you want to meditate. Yeah, you've, you've built up the momentum in your mind. And so then you go to your meditation cushion and you, you know, do your preliminaries. Maybe you clean the space a little bit. You might not do it in any kind of formal way or tight way, but just kind of a psychological cleaning of the space. Because a lot happens during the night, you know, with our dreams and our ups and our downs and, you know, put the cat out and go to the bathroom randomly. And, you know, we, the stuff happens during the night that kind of can make the energy in the room heavy again. So if before you sit, you can do some sort of symbolic cleaning of the space, even if it's as simple as cracking open a window, you know, or, um, I don't know, picking a flower from the garden or lighting a candle and just kind of like dusting off the space of your altar. It could just be making the bed, you know, which you do anyway, maybe, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's with more of a reason, you know, like I'm preparing the space to hold my mind for my practice. And then, you know, you sit down and you think, all right, so that point that I've been trying to get to all morning and that I've been reinforcing all morning, now I'm really going to sit with it in a more systematized way in a more organized way because now i'm awake you know so you could use a prayer or a poem 
or a mantra to set your motivation for your practice. And you don't have to, you could just reinforce the thought that you've been having all morning, but it can be very useful to use a prayer. And a prayer that I like is um, usually one that contains the whole path to enlightenment. These are called Lam Rim prayers. And basically it's just like one verse per topic or two verses per topic. And it just revives the whole path for me. Um, it's nothing I don't already know. It's just reminding me of what I love. And then when I get off the cushion, little things are not gonna bother me as much. So it could be the eight verses of thought transformation or it could be the foundation of all good qualities or, you know, whatever you like. It could be something from Rumi, right? It could be something from your favorite poet, right? It doesn't have to be Buddhist, but something that is words that have uplifted you in the past. This is a really important thing. And it might be that in the morning, setting your motivation actually gets far more attention than the actual meditation itself. Yeah, the meditation itself is a useful thing, but it's only a useful thing if it's done from the right place. So say you've got only 10 minutes in the morning. You know, you think, I don't have any time in the morning. We all have time if we organize our lives differently, right? And it doesn't have to be a huge differently organized structure, right? Just 10 minutes, right? But it could be that in that 10 minutes, um, you think, okay, I'm going to do my motivation. I'm going to get my meditation done. I'm going to do my dedication. Then I'm going to, you know, have this kind of driven morning attitude, <laughs> which then kind of ruins the actual impact of the meditation you've stressed yourself out and you haven't even started your day. You know, your meditation cushion should be like a touchstone to bring you back to yourself and your best motivations. You know, it should be an anchor for you to connect with your spiritual refuge and the, and the meaning and purpose in your life. So if it feels pressurized and it feels like a chore, soften the edges somehow, take the pressure off somehow. So if you just kind of sit and think, all right, the meaning and the purpose of my life is, and you have to just repeat it again and again until it actually feels genuine and authentic. And then you watch your breath for like 30 seconds. That's still a good practice, right? But if you do this like rushed motivation, that's like 10 seconds of may all sentient beings have happiness, blah, 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 and then you watch your breath for 10 minutes, it's not as effective. Yeah, because what is meditation but training the mind? You know, it's not training the mind to like force it, itself to do something that it doesn't want to do. And then you feel successful and disciplined because you forced it. You know, it's like it's not a rebellious animal. I mean, it is in some ways, but don't discipline it like you're whipping a horse. It's terrible. Yeah, you have to be kind to the mind. Otherwise, it will rebel on you. Has anyone ever had that happen where you've had a really good idea about something and you've put a lot of um, attention and inspiration into it and a lot of organization into it? And then once you start doing it, you've got like two or three days where you do it really well and then you just give it up like a new diet or you're going to read more or you're going to start some sort of program and this or that and you have the best intentions in the world but you put so much pressure on it that it's like your mind kind of like implodes and then throws it off and says, I don't want to, you know, as if you had a tiny teenager inside of you saying, you don't, you can't tell me what to do, <laughs> you know? And this is what happens if we make the spiritual path into a chore, or if we make meditation into a chore, is that we'll run around the outskirts of it, doing anything to avoid it, and then hate ourselves for avoiding it because it's what we actually love to do. You know, and it's this weird paradox that can happen. So one of the most important parts of having a meditation practice is just having the routine of at this time or at this chapter in the day, I sit. How I sit, that can evolve over time. What I focus on while I sit, that can evolve over time. But the discipline of, you know, I get up, I go to the bathroom, I brush my teeth, I have a shower, maybe I grab a coffee, you know, have a cracker or something and sit. You know, if you can get that happening, 
then expanding it and deepening it is actually no big deal at all. It just happens organically and naturally over time as you go to more and more teachings. Yeah. So you're, you really have to think about why do I want to do this? Not why should I do this? Yeah, you got to get the word should out of there. Just put it into, I want to do this. This is inspiring. I'm curious about this. This benefits my life because blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So are there any questions about setting a motivation in the morning before you even get to your cushion or what that looks like once you're on your cushion? Does that component ring true for you guys? And is it something that comes easily or you'd like to workshop a little bit? setting the motivation something um i um my practice is fine uh, in terms of the motivation for sitting down yeah i'm not uh where it's really it is a chore uh so um i guess yeah. that's all i can say <laughs> it was quiet so <laughs> yeah 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 no and it doesn't have I'm to a, have but i do i do understand it though i think in the i actually this does happen more in the evening for me Mm. Uh, because I, I uh, meditate a few times a day and in the evening I can get that in my mind that it's a chore. Yeah. Uh, in the morning and the motivation setting up is uh, much easier. Yeah. And, and that could be a, you know, a physiological thing, or it could be a personality thing. You know, some people are morning people, some people are evening people. So there'll be a certain point either in your day or your life where you're not going to want to do the thing that you want to do this paradox you know yeah. you want to do it but you don't want to do it and it's like what's going on with my resistance yeah, you know and yeah no yeah and so evenings you know this is an interesting one too because it could be that you're tired it could be that the day was overwhelming it could be you've got a lot on your plate or you want to spend time with your family or you want to i don't know binge on netflix or whatever you know you have all your plans and evening is kind of when we give ourselves permission to let go from the stress of the day in whatever form you know um, and that's good. We should, <laughs> you know, I mean, it'd be great if we didn't have stress during the day also, but if you, you know, at the end of the day say, oh, and we're done. <sighs> oh, but I was supposed to meditate. Oh, I'm supposed to do some purification or I'm supposed to do some, oh, I don't want to, I have already had a big day, you know, this can happen. And so, you know, to ask yourself how to make it feel like part of your wind down. Yeah. Make it part of your ritual of settling into the evening and letting go. Do you know on really busy, stressful days um, that you've had a lot going on and you get home from wherever, or, you know, we're home all day because of the quarantine. I don't know you finish in some way and um, your mind is racing and you didn't realize how much it was racing until you stopped. Do you know that feeling? right? When you've had a really busy day and you just stop and maybe you're just, you know, having a glass of water or washing the dishes after dinner or whatever. And your mind is just like, zip, 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 you know, that um, winding down from that, we have so many strategies that actually make it worse, but they soften the edges. So it seems like we feel better, right? So we might, I don't know, have a beer or have a glass of wine, or we might, um, you know, go for a walk, go for a walk is probably a good idea, but um, we might watch something on TV or we might read something or we might um, have some sort of rant venting with our partner or there's a lot of things that we do in the evening to kind of soften the edges of the stress of the day. And some of them are useful and some of them actually just kind of, um, keep it jangly in there but they've numbed us enough that we can at least sleep yeah and i mean everybody's habits around this are different but just to kind of ask yourself what does your wind down routine look like you might not even realize you have one you've done it for so many years but at the end of the day what does that look like your wind down routine and is there a way to inject a really intentional reflection where you're processing your day with yourself. You know, you might process it first with your best friend or your partner or whatever, but what's a time when you can even five, 10 minutes sit with today, when did I stay on my path? Today, when, I get, when did I get distracted from my path? 
And when you look at the points where you kind of strayed off your path, like you lost your patience or you got really distracted or, you know, maybe you ate something that you regretted and now you feel bloated, or maybe you said something to someone that you shouldn't have said or whatever it was, ask yourself, is this a pattern? Is this something I do a lot? Not with a self-beating up attitude, not at all. It's more like, oh, I caught it. That's something I've been doing for years and years. And I'm just now noticing that is a pattern. And what drives that pattern? And you're just making a little you know, note to self. Okay, whenever this and this and this happens, I lose my patience. Or whenever this and this and this happens, my attachment is triggered and I do some sort of behavior to soothe myself that's not really healthy or whatever it is. And instead of feeling like that's bad news, you feel like it's amazing news because you finally noticed. You know, like, oh, wow, my life would be a lot easier if I stopped doing that. <laughs> and probably the people around me would appreciate it if I stopped too, you know. So your meditation at the end of the day, it doesn't have to be tightly structured. It doesn't have to be, it shouldn't have tightness around it at all. But I mean, it can be something very reflective. And then you shift to what went well in the day. What's something that I again and again do nicely for people and do nicely for myself and connect with my spiritual path. And this can be even more triggering for us than looking at the faults or mistakes. We're not used to being like, oh, good for me. You know, it feels kind of yucky. Like, why would you do that? But if you can do it with some objectivity, it gives you more enthusiasm to do it even more deeply, even more often. You know, you think, oh, I noticed that someone was struggling and I reached out. Actually, I'm, I'm good at noticing when people are struggling in this or that way. And I usually do reach out and it's usually pretty helpful. And that's something that I've done for years. And I'm glad that I do that. What's a way I can do it even more deeply with an even cleaner motivation and not any kind of like self-satisfied, I'm such a deep and wise person kind of weird ego trip, you know? But I'm so glad I do that. Okay, I'm going to do that more and better and deeper. But yay, you know, you're allowed to think that, <laughs> right? In fact, it's useful. So some sort of clear the slate, get ready for the next day, clear the slate, just purify, whether you use a Vajrasattva practice or you just reflect on the interdependence of things. It can help you let go of the stress of the day and then think of the good things, end with the good things and really kind of uplift yourself and think, yep, so far so good, not too bad, you know, continuing on. Um, then, you know, if you want to add anything to your practice, if you're inspired, go ahead, but sometimes you can amp yourself up and then make it difficult to sleep. So in the evening, just a nice simple practice where maybe you start with a non-reactive meditation, just watching the thoughts, you know, clarity of mind, sky not the clouds, and then move to a purification practice. That's that's probably fine. Yeah, does that make sense? Something just really gentle where you wind down, where you're watching your thoughts without getting attached to your thoughts and then shift to a reflection of the day and a purification. Yeah, thoughts about evening practice? You can end the day with the same, motive, same thought that you started it with, you know, if you started with, um, compassion end with compassion, you know? I, I agree with everything you've said, of course, and the patterns uh, to recognize are very important. Meaning, for example, in the evening, my purification, okay, I'm, I actually can look back now and see eventually that was too much of a chore. I, I made it into a chore mm -hmm. when it shouldn't have been. Yeah. And so then I just shifted and I did something different. And once I did that, I felt much better. So there are even patterns of the meditation that we may do that may, like, I think what you were saying earlier, uh, you know, you're like, I got to do it type mm -hmm. thing. And, and so you got to kind of also recognize that habit. So you don't kind of fall into that trap too. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. yeah I, I change at night now. Yeah, that helps. 
Yeah. And yeah, it's, it, you know, what exactly that you do can totally evolve over time. It's just, it, it is the routine. And my, my own teacher says again and again, it is so much more useful to have a small, consistent practice every single day than to have a giant practice every now and then. You know, it's like, yay, you went to a 10 day Vipassana. Like, what do you want a medal? Like, great. I mean, that's useful and you can have all sorts of interesting insights, but like, now what? Like, are you a nicer person? <laughs> you know, it's like, yay, a retreat can kind of um, connect you and it can kind of reinvigorate and re-inspire you. But if it doesn't then pull into your daily life, it was just spiritual entertainment, you know? Um, and so the path is, you know, it's ordinary. It's every day. And if we make it have to be too magic, then we put a pressure on it that's not fair for ourselves. Because occasionally there will be some magic and occasionally there will be really amazing connections. But if that's what we're banking on happening every single time, then we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. You know, if what we can bank on is you know, just like eating well or exercising, if you do something routinely, it's going to have a long term effect that's very powerful. And of course, some days you're not going to feel like it, or some days you might even forget. But if the underlying theme is, this is something I'm doing, you know, like I brush my teeth every day, some days it's quite fun, some days it's boring, some days I don't feel like it, but I'm brushing my teeth. <laughs> right? And so far, so good, no cavities, you know, like, this is the way we need to think of meditation, even, even though it does have the potential for amazing things to happen. We shouldn't have that kind of pressure on it of, it didn't feel good, so it must not be working. I think that um, sometimes our most difficult meditations are the most useful afterwards. You know, those times that you've really been struggling to focus or you've been really, really distracted and coming back to the object, distracted, coming back to the object. And there's a lot of push and pull internally, but you just stuck with it. Not too tight, not too loose. You just stuck with it. Then when you're done and you stand up, often you have a lot of mental clarity and your day goes really smoothly. But all in the moment on the cushion, it didn't feel like a great time. And it felt kind of like, oh, this is a struggle today. But actually, you cleared a lot of obstacles. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so don't be too hard on yourself. But basically, now we're going to shift into like content. So what kind of meditations could we do? And I'm sure that um, Miriam has been telling you that basically we have single pointed meditations and analytical meditations. And they are as they sound, um, but do, does someone feel comfortable telling me what your understanding of the two different types are? What's a, what's a single pointed meditation and what's an analytical meditation? At the risk of, <laughs> no, good evening everyone. I'm sorry for my lateness, but you know I work too. Um, hello, and it's nice to see you again. Very nice to see you again, hi. Um, well, I guess, I, my understanding, when it's our single pointed, it's like a focus or our attention on something like our breath or whatever you may, may choose. I mean, I do it in lots of different ways because I also teach yoga and I, do, I don't always focus on the breath to give um, people something to focus on. So something to focus on. And then when it's analytical, we, um, we are taking maybe a subject that we are maybe struggling with or something and and analyze it like we were talking last week week anger for example and why something you know pushed our buttons and um and try and iron it out if you like mm -hmm. yeah. yeah something like that yeah yeah definitely and you know single pointed meditation it means that you're holding your focus on one thing, you know, one thing. And analytical may, means that you're holding your focus on one concept, but there's movement, you know? And so the discipline is you stay with whatever you picked <laughs> during that session. You don't have to stay with it forever and ever. Like now I only meditate on patience and I can never meditate on loving kindness. But if you've decided to meditate on patience, meditate on patience 
And if you have a brilliant idea about loving kindness occur to you in the middle of your patient's meditation, you say, that's very interesting. I'll come back to you. Patience is what I'm focusing on now. Why? Because otherwise it's just a reflection or it's just a loose association or you're just thinking to yourself. And that's useful in another context in another time. But if you want power and depth, you have to stay disciplined. Yeah? Because meditation isn't necessarily learning new things. It's reinforcing what you already know so that it integrates and actually becomes how you are now. Does that make sense? Right? Reflection, you might be coming to new ideas and you might be coming to new understandings. And, you know, when you're hearing and listening to teachings that is happening as well, conversation that's happening as well. But once you get to the cushion, you want to know where you're going and you want to already be on board with it. Yeah. Because you want it to integrate. So it might be that you're like, yep, compassion's a good idea. I like compassion. And then, you know, the next moment you yell at your spouse. You know, and you don't see their suffering and you're not kind about their suffering and you think, oh, I thought compassion was important, but apparently not just then. Okay, so <laughs> when I meditate on compassion, how am I going to reinforce what I'm already on board with? And so you need a structure. And there are a million structures and you can use a handbook or you can use the Lam Rim Chen Mo outlines or whatever. But the easiest structure for self-guided analytical meditation is basically to, you know, you set your motivation like always, but then you take a moment and define what it is you're meditating on. Yeah, define it first. So say, say we're using the example compassion. You say, okay, what is compassion? What is compassion? What is compassion? And then, you know, the Buddhist definition is the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering. So that's interesting. But what does it feel like? What does it look like in daily life? So you're, um, you're defining what it is in words, and then you're defining what it is in experience. Okay, so you, you need to have tidy words. You need to have studied enough to know compassion is the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering, including myself, including my enemies, yada, yada. You know that in words. But what is it like to be on the giving end? What is it like to be on the receiving end? What is it like in this context? What is it like in that context? So you just explore the word, the concept, you explore it. And when you come to a resonance of this is compassion, then you ask yourself two questions. What is the disadvantage for myself and others when it's not present? What is the advantage for myself and others when it is present? all of which is intellectually very straightforward, you already know, but now you're really going deeply into it experientially. So what are the disadvantages of when compassion is not present? So then you think about your life and you think, all right, so when people aren't compassionate to me, you know, I feel isolated and misunderstood and disrespected and alone, blah, 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 whatever when I am not having compassion for other people, they feel disregarded, they feel unloved, you know, they feel this and that and that, you know, you can make an educated guess. Um, you can think my relationships are negatively affected in this or that way, you know? And so you just kind of go through different disadvantages until it hits your heart, this is not how I want to live. I do not want to live a life without compassion, which you already believe, right? When it hits your heart, that's kind of the moment of resonance where you can move an analytical meditation into something more single pointed, just for a little bit. So you, it's kind of like, you know, like, like striking, striking a bell, you know, like it resonates, right? So when it's resonating, a life without compassion is got so many disadvantages. A life without compassion is not a life that I want to invest in. I need a life with compassion. You just sit with that. Like, I knew that was true before, but I really know that now. Yeah, you just hold it. 
And then you'll get distracted at some point, you know, maybe in 20 seconds, maybe in 20 minutes. But when you get distracted from holding the truth of that resonance, you shift to what are the advantages of having compassion? Yeah. What are the advantages of when people are compassionate to me? What are the advantages of when I'm compassionate to them? What are the advantages of when there's compassion in the family, in the workplace, in society? What positive things flow from that? And you just really explore what is the advantage of compassion. And at some point you come to the resonance of this really is the point of everything. This really is what makes the world bearable. <laughs> this is what makes the world beautiful. This is what blah, 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 blah. And you have some sort of resonance and you stay there. Does it make sense? Yeah. And it might be then having explored the, you know, disadvantages and advantages that you have some sort of conclusion you come to like, okay, so my mother-in-law <laughs> dot, 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 you know, okay, so my boss dot, dot, dot. Um, you, you know, if you come to some kind of conclusion about your daily life, then what you can do is just repeat it to yourself so that it sticks because what can happen is that you can have some interesting ideas happen on the cushion and then you stand up and forget. So if you come to some kind of like concrete thing, reinforce it by repeating it or even write it down briefly, but you know, then it's contained and then you do a dedication. And you think all of the energy I put into these thoughts, may it go to the development of my fullest potential for the benefit of all sentient beings you know, or whatever dedication prayer you like. It could even be the same as the prayer you used for your motivation, you know, your bookending, your practice always. Yeah, always bookending it with motivation at the beginning, dedication at the end, launch it well, launch it into life well. Yeah, but that's how you do an analytical meditation where you don't have a structure in front of you, but you know that for it to be a good meditation, you need a structure. That make sense yeah in yeah any questions about that so then you can do it with any topic yeah go ahead i was just gonna say yeah <laughs> that was good i mean it just hearing that structure out loud like that yeah that that was that helped that's nice e easy even easy. though it's not it's not easy i uh, in my experience but that made it sound easy <laughs> Yeah, well, you don't want to be struggling with the structure as well as the context, you know, and right. the content, right? So if at least yeah. you have somewhere yeah, to go. Yeah. yeah, good. Yep. And, you know, your wisdom is developed in so many ways. Your wisdom is developed through hearing and study. Your wisdom is developed through reflection your, and discussion. And your wisdom is developed through meditation. So don't think that, like, you're only developing your practice in your mind through meditation and that's the only place where it happens you know the other kinds of wisdom are developed are just as important and they all reinforce each other right so you hear about compassion you think about compassion then you meditate on compassion then the next time you hear about it you hear about it in a deeper way you know and it's then your life becomes a practice like this so it's it's a useful thing, analytical meditation, because there are so many things we already know. There's so much wisdom we already have from our life, and then we forget it. You know, how is it to like capture the lessons and make them stick and make us live by them rather than just remember occasionally? You know, so, so this, so analytical meditation is kind of a way to prevent your wisdom from slipping through your fingers. Yeah. And, you know, analytical meditation can also kind of go into a visualization form like in a Tonglen meditation, you know, so you might attach a concept to a visual image 
For example, <clears throat> I want all sentient beings to be free from suffering, compassion, and now I want to take all of that suffering on to overcome my ego and my self-cherishing and my resistance. So I'm going to visualize all of what I don't want as gross smog and soot and dirt, and I'm going to breathe it in and give it to all of the things that block my heart. And then my loving kindness and compassion and all of the good things, the happiness in my life, I want to give to all sentient beings. So now I'm going to attach that to a visualization of golden light that I breathe out. So breathe in compassion, breathe out love, breathe in black smoke, bring, breathe out golden light. And each cycle is breaking down the negative self-cherishing thought that creates kind of a prison around my good heart, you know? So your analysis then can like build. And what can happen is that if you have a practice that you do a lot and you start to get bored, what that means is there's some space in your mind to add elaboration. So you don't have to see it as a bad thing. You can think, okay, I've done this compassion meditation many times and I've kind of hit the same level of conclusion for a couple of weeks now, I don't seem to be going any deeper with it or reinforcing it in any new way that seems useful. And in fact, it's getting maybe a little dry, even though I'm still on board. It's okay. You can just weave in a little bit more elaboration or weave in a more advanced form of the same concept. You know, what, what we don't want to think is, I've got it now, I'm done. <laughs> You know, that's, that's the danger. Like, I understand patience, I shall never be angry again, right? What nonsense, you know, and but I mean, I have heard people say this in meditation classes of, oh, I don't get angry anymore. And it might be that you've never you haven't acknowledged your anger for a long time. But it doesn't mean it's not there. And it's having effects in other ways. It's giving you depression, or it's giving you anxiety, or it's giving you health problems. But it's not like you're done with anger just because you've suppressed it or just because you believe that patience is a good idea, you know? So meditation is like a container to allow your mess to come to the surface and you just to go, all right, that's the bit I'm working on today. Doesn't mean I'm done, but it means there's a level now that I'm able to have flexibility and movement with. And you'll find that the more analytical meditation you do, the less defensive you become when other people criticize you. And this is because you know yourself well enough that the criticism, it's like it can't land where it's not true. And where it is true, you've already made peace with it. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. So when we're defensive or when we're hurt by criticism, it's usually that there's an element of truth in their criticism and we haven't quite reconciled it or what they're saying is totally wrong and we're just agitated that they would think that and then we're like struggling to figure out why would they say that why would they say that what have i done you know but if you've actually met yourself very very deeply and someone says i don't know you have a stupid sense of humor you can say yes i do <laughs> you know it doesn't hurt because almost like the more you own your stuff the less it feels personal it's a paradox, you know? So there's, there's no more weapons to wound you. So anyway, that's just one of the many like beneficial side effects of good analysis, but um, it has to be personal or else it doesn't work. You know, so you could have some beautiful love and light meditation where you're sending loving kindness to all sentient beings. But if you haven't sat with what is love anyway, what is what are the things that I'm working on that block it? You know, if you haven't kind of touched the deep roots of the philosophy behind it, it, it stays superficial and it has less of an effect. Yeah, so it has to be personal. So any questions about an analytical meditation? Could I ask a question on what you said uh, just now on uh, acknowledging anger? Mm. And then also trying to, because I get confused between the two, like I'm, I'm working on acknowledging my anger. Yeah, without feeling it. That's challenging for me. And then, and then I'm trying to have compassion, which I completely forget when I finally acknowledge the anger. So could you help me out here? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think it's, it's pretty common. We, 
we know that anger is not useful and anger is not justified from a Buddhist perspective because it means the wish to harm. And the wish to harm is not going to do anybody any good and is just going to perpetuate the cycle of violence. And whether it's verbal violence or psychological violence or physical violence, anger is got a violent aspect to it. And we don't want to add more of that into this crazy world. We're on board. <laughs> and then we're angry and we think, no, no, don't be angry. Don't be angry. You know, it's very common. And uh, the problem is, is that we we know what we're supposed to think so then we get ashamed of what we actually do think because there's lag time you know between what you understand intellectually and what you integrate emotionally or spiritually there's a time lapse it just takes a while to sink in you know like digesting a healthy meal it just takes a while to digest so what you want to do is to say okay why am i angry like a scientist with objectivity what am i saying to myself about what is justified about my anger you know i'm angry because of this and 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 you try to do that in a less angry time because if you're doing that while you're angry it'll just be an endless list and you'll be reminded of everything wrong in the whole world and it'll never end but if you're a bit calm and you think okay i'm angry because of this and this and this what you'll find is that somewhere in your anger is an accurate observation and then an inaccurate conclusion. So it could be that your boss is very disrespectful and asks too much of his coworkers and colleagues and puts too much time pressure on people and expects them to work longer hours than they're paid for. You know, it could be that that's one of the reasons you're angry and that is in fact an accurate observation that he does in fact do. You know, and so your anger is not going to let go because it knows that that is a true thing that he does that's not okay, right? So you're, you're hanging on to, I have to feel this way because that is a thing I see that's not okay. And we've attached the emotional response with the observation as if they're the same thing. Yeah, how you feel about it and what you see about it are not the same thing, but they're so used to going together. So when you're unpacking your anger, you want to say, all right, so where's the, where's the wisdom in there? Okay, I've nailed it. I've drawn a border around it. That is what I see that is not okay. Now my response has been passive aggressive or aggressive aggressive or whining to all my coworkers or bringing it home and whining to my spouse or overeating or undereating or whatever, you know, like compulsively buying stuff or whatever you do, you know. And then you go, okay, so in no way have any of those behaviors helped the issue, right? Um, you might say things to yourself like, I have to be angry and passionate about injustice, otherwise people won't know that I care, right? Or I need it to fuel me, I need it to give me energy, I need, I need the power of my anger to right wrongs. These are things we think. And that could be that historically, that is what you used and historically has had some kind of effectiveness and things driven from that place are short-lived you have a burst and then you're often deflated afterwards sometimes you're uplifted if it like works but what we want to ask yourself is is there a better way now that i'm on a spiritual path is there a better way to right wrongs and to solve injustice and to have the energy and the passion of anger without any of the judgmentalness criticism or wish to harm you can still have the energy, you can still have the momentum, you can still think I must right wrongs, I must be assertive. But if you're coming from this really calm and steady place, you have all of your wisdom accessible. If you're coming from an agitated place, you have your most animal responses accessible. Yeah. So if you're asking yourself what actually might help or can I help or is there a way into this, you know, you become more strategic rather than justifying your feeling. Yeah, because if you're trying to justify your feeling, it's just adding fuel to the fire and it's not giving you any peace. You know, you've just given whatever you're angry at or whoever you're angry at all the power to steal your mental space. 
they didn't even want it probably, but you've just given them all the power, you know, and now you're upset and you're not able to enjoy your life because you've given them all the power to upset you. So when you're looking at acknowledging your anger or acknowledging any negative state of mind, it's this analytical process of what is the accurate observation? What is the ineffective response? Yeah, and then what is the flaw in the logic of my current response? Because the way you know a delusion is present or an affliction is present is that your mind is agitated. If your mind is not agitated, there's less of an affliction present. You can think they did this and this and this and that was unacceptable and I need to address it from a calm space. You have before in other contexts, right? There have been times when you've been able to see things that were incorrect, wrong, or harmful, but you haven't been all worked up about it. You know, it's just we're so used to thinking you have to be worked up about it, otherwise people won't know that it matters. Yeah, so you're acknowledging that it exists. I am angry right now, <laughs> you know, and anger is a thing that I want to work on. And let's unpack it rather than jump over it and say, anger, bad, I'm patient now, you, you know, we're not. So acknowledging anger isn't the same thing as justifying anger or acknowledging attachment isn't the same thing as justifying attachment. But without acknowledging it, there is no antidote, you know? Um, the, the big difference in Buddhism is that we don't have such a heavy hand about therefore you're bad. You know, you can have anger, you can have attachment, you can have all these negative states of mind, you can have bad verbal behavior, bad physical behavior, and none of that says that you're broken or bad or should be punished. It just means that is the natural result of the conditions of your life so far. Don't put unnecessary ownership over it. It's not your fault. It's your responsibility. It's totally different. It's not your fault, you know? It's nobody's fault, right? Or it's everyone's fault, if you like. It's everyone's fault, but it's nobody's fault because everything is so interdependent that one behavior that you have, could you trace it back and find all of the conditions for it? You could say, oh, I do that because my mother does that. Well, why did she do that? Oh, because her mother and her mother and her mother and, you know, the Depression and World War II and, uh, you know, how far back do you want to go to find one behavior's starting point? You know, time is beginningless, ignorance is beginningless, you know? And so there's, there's a million things that brought about our mistakes, but they landed here with us, so we take responsibility for them. But we don't need to think that we're bad because of them. So that makes it easier to acknowledge things like anger. You go, oh, whew, anger landed here. That's not helpful. Let's work on that. But you don't think, oh, I'm such a bad person for all my anger. You know, that's just a trip. We don't need to do that. Yeah. So is, can you see the difference though, between acknowledging that it's here, it's something that you need to work with. It's something that's not useful, but it's not you. It's not you. It's just a yes, response. I'm, I'm, thank you. That yeah. was uh, really helpful to ask those questions and try to, it's really helpful also to hear when I'm not calm, that's when I'm afflicted. I never actually thought about that before. That yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting definition. I, I appreciate that in, in Buddhism because it's like, right, the words can be accurate and then you think that the emotion is rational, but then you think, is there any other time I've had these same words in my head, but I haven't been so stirred up about it, you know? Um, so if you're feeling agitated, that's not the time to make any choices, right? <laughs> Duh. But I mean, you know, just naming it. If you're feeling agitated and you think, I have to talk to them about this and this and this, that might be true, but not right now. <laughs> you know, um, Afflictions also give you the illusion of urgency. Yeah, they, they put a pressure on decisions and choices that's actually not there. It feels like you have to deal with it now. You have to. You know that feeling of urgency that can come with negative states of mind? And so that's a nice little like warning alarm of, oh, actually, I think an affliction is driving right now. I don't think wisdom is driving because I feel like I have to deal with it right now. 
you know. And it's easier to catch with anger because anger is so uncomfortable, but it does, it happens with attachment as well. Like I have to buy that right now. It's like, do you have to buy that right now? You've lived your whole life up until now without it. Is it that important? And it could be that you still decide to buy it. But if you can tell yourself, if I still want it in 20 minutes, then I'll buy it. Because sometimes in that 20 minutes, your mind has time to settle down and the spell is broken. Yeah, and you go, oh, I don't really need that. Do you know this feeling? Yeah. So the illusion of urgency and pressure and I must decide now and I have to, all of that is usually afflicted. You know, occasionally it's like survival instinct, you know, but usually it's affliction. Yeah. Okay, so um, I thought we'd do a little, have a little break and then do an analytical meditation and then um, go on to single pointed meditation and do one of those. <laughs> 